I'm going to name you uh, international affairs correspondent for the Katie Halper show. <laughs> anyway, so all of that to say, let us know, please. What are your thoughts on the on what just happened in Pakistan and the uh, ouster of the prime minister Imran Khan? So I think the first thing to do is to just take a step back and recognize that um, late last year, there was an enormous concern with what was coming, which was the inflation question. You know, um, during the pandemic, it was clear that there was a so-called supply side shock. Um, China was in lockdown. And then now with the lockdown in Shanghai, this is a considerable worry. Um, and since so much of the production of goods and some services takes place in China, there was a real supply side shock, a supply side shock simultaneously with the, um, you know, the lockdowns ending in parts of the West, people interested again in going and, you know, going to restaurants or going to see movies or just going out and buying more, actually, um, you began to see the classic problem of uh, people bidding for fewer goods. And that's when inflation starts to go up. Now, there was a fear of this inflation by itself. In fact, in Pakistan in January, um, inflation went up by 13%. This is a very high number. You know, Imran Khan had, had said in 2018 as the prime minister of Pakistan that, you know, he's going to tackle the problem of livelihood in the country. So when inflation spiked near 13% in January, again, it wasn't something particular to Pakistan. It's been happening all over the world. Because of that, there was a real concern about what might happen. You know, the economic crisis could go out of control. Same thing started to occur in Sri Lanka, where again, inflation rates went very high. Um, and we see this in Honduras, in Peru, and in several countries. Okay, now you get the war in Ukraine. Um, about 30% of the world's wheat comes from Ukraine and Russia combined. You get the US sanctions on Russia, very harsh sanctions. Uh, you get the lockdown in, um, in China again, because they have a zero COVID policy. All of this, you know, uh, put prices up again. A uh, lot of pressure on these countries, you know, uh, the inability to use their domestic currency to buy enough stuff. Anyway, in Sri Lanka, the economic crisis just catapulted into a political crisis against the Rajapaksha family, which governs that country. In fact, the Economist magazine headline on Sri Lanka was the economic crisis becomes a political crisis. Um, in Honduras and Peru, it was relatively measured. It was there a kind of fuel price protest, bus drivers and so on. In Pakistan, it was interesting. Um, several things were happening in Pakistan at the same time. And I don't want to emphasize one over the other. One, there was mass urban and then middle class discontent because you saw a rise in middle class poverty as a consequence of inflation. You know, how many people can tolerate 13, 14 percent price rise? The United States, you know, there's a, a expectation that uh, prices will go up by one percent this quarter, perhaps one percent next quarter. It's disturbing for people, you know, if you're on fixed incomes and so on. Or if you, you, in fact, are having a hard time making a living anyway. So the first thing is that there was an economic crisis. I want to say this, Katie, because this is actually not talked about much on the, you know, interwebs. People go immediately to this is a coup, this is a conspiracy and so on. There's mass discontent. That's for sure. Secondly, Mr. Imran Khan um, made an interesting bet. You've got to understand Pakistan, the main institution that takes um, you know, charge of the country is the military, the main institution. Since 1947, the military has basically governed the country. You know, they've allowed civilian leadership here and there, but they basically hold the rod, you know. And Imran Khan, when his party came to power, he was fully backed by the military, you know, fully backed by the military. Now, interestingly, um, he in the last few weeks began to say things that were not uh, sitting well in Washington. For instance, um, he was in Moscow when the uh, Russian government launched the invasion of Ukraine. And in Moscow, he basically went and met, you know, Russian President Vladimir Putin, and they had a cordial conversation. And he basically suggested, I stand with Russia. 
comes back to Pakistan, finds that the military is not happy with him. In fact, weird, the military chief made a political comment, said that we are against what's happening in Ukraine. Now, imagine that. It's a formerly democratic country, and yet the military chief is speaking about political things um, outside uh, you know, the ambit of the government. Anyway, um, Mr. Uh, Imran Khan was also interested in substituting some of the reliance that Pakistan has on Saudi Arabia. Pakistan buys a lot of oil from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia gives it credits, you know, um, they give money in credit. And, you know, Pakistan is on the hook for a lot of money to Saudi Arabia. Um, it's interesting that uh, there were like a million things happening there. Now, Mr. Imran Khan reacted to all these things by saying it's a foreign conspiracy. That argument took hold among his supporters. And in fact, the new prime minister who has come in um, has had to, you know, it's very interesting. Once Imran Khan started to say there is a, um, you know, there's a foreign conspiracy and so on. And, and as that began to pick up, the new prime minister, Shabazz um, uh, Sharif, he had to basically also adopt that line and he has called for a parliamentary inquiry, whether this is a foreign, you know, an attempted coup in the country and so on. So it's not, I'm not saying that there was a coup or wasn't a coup, but the argument stuck. It's people have a receptivity to that argument. Now, very quickly, Imran Khan tried to do a couple of constitutional things, you know, dissolving parliament, calling for elections and all that. But the appetite in the opposition wasn't for that. And, you know, they wanted to have uh, him removed from office and, and so on and so forth, which is exactly what happened. Point is, of course, there's pressure from the United States on the military. Of course, there is. I mean, that's the reason the military chief spoke in that way. But I also want to say that the military chiefs also have an alignment with Washington. It's not like Washington is telling them what to do. They are uncomfortable with any break from Washington. That's one. And secondly, um, you know, Washington has given Pakistan enormous latitude to uh, build its economic ties with China. There's been little interference there. And I think the reason is, and here we come to the broader Asian question, is the United States has basically figured out that it doesn't have the economic ability to compete with China when it comes to development aid to countries like Pakistan, um, to countries in Africa, and to some extent countries in Latin America. The Chinese largesse is much greater. So it has to create a lane to allow this sort of trade relationship. But the US still has a very close link with the military. So I'm not saying it was a coup, it wasn't a coup. I think the story is quite complicated. But certainly there was foreign interference of one kind. And, and whether there was or not, let's see what the parliamentary inquiry comes up with. And what does that reveal about the state of politics in Pakistan right now? And not only right now, but it, this seems to be like a trend that a lot of prime ministers in Pakistan don't fill out a full term. Why, why is that? Well, you know, um, you get to fill out uh, your whole term uh, if, if you don't have a military breathing down your neck one. Secondly, if you're able to break the back of the basic problems that confront the people, you know, the problems of poverty, hunger, um, you know, illiteracy and so on. And, you know, the last time you got a kind of even a socialistic agenda on the table was the 1970s, when Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who was a creature of the military, broke away a little bit and, you know, talked in a socialistic vein um, it didn't help him. He was himself victim of a coup and was killed in prison by General Ziaul Haq, the man who uh, helps the United States uh, destabilize Afghanistan. Um, but still, that was a moment. And by the way, it's not something to celebrate, um, you know, by waving flags, because this is the same man, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who participated in the terrible military um, violence in East Pakistan, which becomes Bangladesh. But anyway, at the time, there was some talk about taking care of hunger and so on. You know, Katie, if your government is unable to move an agenda against a rigid class structure, um, it's hard to finish a term. Uh, and as I said, the military, I mean, you know, the military um, 
it's basically in, it was fundamentally integrated with the British military. Um, and then in the course of the Afghanistan destabilization campaign, it got fundamentally integrated into the US military. And they basically will not allow um, you know, the elite structure to be dismantled in any way. Now, across the border in India, things are not great either. There's enormous hunger, deprivation, and so on. Why is it that the governments are able to um, you know, f finish their term? I mean, that could be a question. Well, to some extent that in India, the military is engaged. Um, the military is, is within the barracks. It doesn't, it's not allowed to exceed the barracks. And I think when you have the military basically calling the shots, it's very destabilizing for a civilian government. So any predictions that you have to make? I mean, you've got a new government there. Uh, you have to understand that the two principal parties who for years were at each other's throats the parties of the party of the Bhuttos, the People's Party of Pakistan, Pakistan People's Party, that's you know run by um, Mrs. Benazir Bhutto's son. Uh, he is the head of that party, and the other side, the party of Nawaz Sharif, is you know family's fief. These are two feudal parties that are basically running things. Obviously, they are not going to um, you know at all nudge against the power structure, the class structure in Pakistan. So they're not going to solve the problem of inflation or anything like that. It's true that the military basically, I think, you know, gave its blessings and said, go and govern in Islamabad. How long that lasts, it's hard to say. You know, um, the military is, is concerned about a couple of things. One, its relationship with Washington. I believe that's very important to the military. Secondly, I think the military is really, really concerned about maintaining the class structure in Pakistan. They don't want to, you know, this is not a radical military. There are no Hugo Chavez's in the leadership anywhere here. So they don't want to rattle the class structure. And the third thing I think is they are concerned about the military. You know, the closest parallel to Pakistan is Egypt, where, you know, during the Arab Spring, uh, the military, General Field Marshal Tantawi, uh, very, you know, cleverly in a way, um, sort of went along with the protests and they toppled Hosni Mubarak, a former military man. When Mubarak was sent off to Saudi Arabia, uh, the military retained power. Then the military allowed a little bit of democracy. They allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to run under Mohammed Morsi. The moment Morsi started to go a little too far away from the military's own agenda, they toppled him and brought back General Abdul Fattah al-Sisi. And now General Abdul Fattah al-Sisi goes back home, takes off his uniform, puts on a suit, and he returns as the civilian president. I mean, the, the, the very close relation between what you see in Egypt, where again, the military is a great defender of the class structure in Egypt. You know, uh, again, a great defender of the so-called special relationship with Washington. Um, they don't want to rattle that. And they are concerned about the military. You know, in, in both countries, military actually has an enormous role in the economy. Uh, when you go in Pakistan in, in shops, you used to be able to see a lot of stuff like soap. You could buy Fauji brand soap and, you know, various things. Fauji, Fauji means the soldiers. Um, they actually sold goods and services uh, into the economy and they made a lot of money on it. Uh, the military is the largest landowner and so on. So between the military in Pakistan and in Egypt, there's similarities. They just won't let go. They won't allow the people to actually breathe in, in, in that sense. So whether it's, you know, Mr. Sharif or it's Imran Khan, it's a matter of latitudes, honestly. Uh, what needs to go is, is this milit the carapace of the military, which is basically throttling democracy in the country.